Um, my name is Chris Kilheffer. I'm the Associate Director of, of Access Services here at um, Yale University, Sterling and Bass Libraries. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Lauren Brown. I'm an Access Analyst here in the Access Services Department, and um, I look at data structures to help our workflows as well as design some small applications and uh, data structures within um, the Access Services Department and sometimes across the library. Hey, Lois, did you need to do any other housekeeping before we go ahead and get started with the presentation? No, you're good. Okay, thanks so much. Um, so today, Lauren and I want to talk about some homegrown tools that we've developed here at Yale Starling and Bass Libraries that we use for optimizing our day-to-day -day workflows. Um, before doing that, I want to talk just a little bit about our department structure here um, because it's a little bit unusual the way we organize things. And our department structure was, uh, to a certain extent, driving our thinking as we developed these tools as it's relevant. Um, one moment, just have a little technical moment uh, problem for one second. Thank you. Okay, sorry, just having trouble advancing the, the slide there. Um, so we had a reorg here about five years ago, um, and one of the results of that reorg was to create a unit that is essentially responsible for all of the requests we receive for general collections um, materials here in Sterling and Bass. And that's any kind of request for anything um, within general collections, no matter where the request originates, um, uh, the, or what uh, kind of delivery um, or form that they want that um, request fulfilled. So this is a list of what this group does. You know, so they do a ton of retrievals from our various collection locations. Um, we have a very active paging service here at Sterling and Bass. We do about 75,000 pages a year. Um, our bar direct service as well, they're paging for, that's a consortial resource sharing um, service that we are a part of. And also for interlibrary loan, they're doing the retrievals. And after getting the materials from uh, collection areas, they are doing whatever has to happen to, um, to fill the request at that point. So if it's a scanning request, whether it's for ILL, scan our local scan and deliver, uh, e-reserves or rapid ILL, no matter what the service they're doing is scanning. Um, if it's something that needs to be shipped out, so, so that would be in a library loan or bar direct, they're doing all the packing and processing using UPS WorldShip. Um, they're doing all the lending processing for both of those services as well, using either Iliad or for bar direct, we use Relay D2D. Um, and then they're also um, doing the receiving of any incoming materials for both of those services. Uh, in addition to all that request-based work, um, they're also doing all the transfers from um, these two libraries to our offsite storage location. So it's a lot of work um, that this group is doing. Uh, it comes out to be about 170,000 requests per year. Um, we find that organizing this way gives us a lot of benefit. You know, we find that um, there's a certain efficiency of scale that we get from, from grouping it all together in the one unit. Uh, it gives us flexibility in terms of directing. Uh, we have a number of people who all know how to do any of those um, tasks, and so we can direct labor where it's most needed at any given time. Um, but it's a lot of work, you know, in, in addition to having 70,000, it's also 75,000 offsite off transfers in any given year. Um, so we find it definitely comes with challenges as well. Um, when you have that kind of high volume, um, it, it certainly creates potential for request to slip through the cracks. Um, and I think that's literally true, you know, because we're, we're relying heavily on paper retrieval slips. So paper retrieval slips go missing. You know, they, they can be misplaced, they can be accidentally recycled. Um, that's a uh, danger uh, for us. Uh, in addition to that, you know, when you have this kind of high volume, uh, it's very easy to concentrate and maybe over-concentrate uh, on just the easy stuff, the stuff that's routine. Um, we find that uh, it's about 90% of the time when we go to do our retrievals that we will find the item on the first search, you know, just under 90%. Um, that's great. That's a really good number. Um, but we want to make sure we're giving the right attention to that other 10-11%. Um, because when you're looking at this kind of volume, you're talking that other 10-11% represents uh, you know, nearly 20,000 requests a year, um, that's a lot of unhappy people if we're going to neglect those. Um, so the overall challenge for us is, you know, how do we retain the benefits of this kind of high volume operation 
um, while decreasing the number of missing and action requests, you know, keeping the number of timeouts as low as possible, giving that attention to you know, non-routine requests and making our turnaround time as you know, tight as possible. So as we approach that challenge, um, we, we thought about you know, how can we lean on our data, you know, the data that we have in the various systems that we're already using to help us. Um, I think that you know, I certainly can fall into the habit of thinking about you know, pulling data primarily for the purposes of you know, assessment, um, strategic decision-making, you know, giving us a sense of where we are, where do we need to go, um, big picture, um, seeing the forest, not the trees um, kind of thinking. And of course, we need data for that. Um, we were trying to take a very different approach here where we're thinking, you know, how can we use data, not in the service of that longer term perspective, but day to day, uh, you know, identifying the trees as opposed to the forest, you know, which specific trees need attention. Um, that was the uh, perspective we brought to this. Um, to talk about the, the actual approach we took to building these tools and pulling data, I'm gonna turn it over to Lauren. Hi everyone again. Um, so uh, uh, any tool that you can interrogate your data is going to be important, obviously, but um, I found that SQL Server reporting services has lent itself really well to um, finding these individual trees, these, um, these individual transactions that need a real-time answer to proactively um, deal with them and to optimize our daily workflow. Um, I've worked with Tableau a lot, uh, sorry, actually not a lot, uh, a little, and um, in my experience, it's fantastic as a graphical <coughs> tool, but um, seems to uh, be best for comparing, um, trend, for, for looking at trends and comparing um, uh, history of one year to another year. So in terms of which tool might you use, um, obviously it's going to depend on, on the question. Um, First question down below, it says, um, is use of the physical collection increasing or decreasing? I, I leave it to you to, uh, to form a, a guess about my suggestion there. Um, sec the second question, which requests need to be served today or will time out? Uh, when you see something like which request, it naturally lends itself, in my opinion, to um, SQL Server reporting services. How does cost lift turnaround compare to previous years? You might use Tableau but something like where could this book, this particular book be, if it's not on the shelf, um, that's the kind of data that I think SQL Server Reporting Services is very good um, at answering. Um, so I wanted to show you uh, just kind of a, a quick view of what a report might look like um, at execution time, and we're gonna talk about this report in more detail. But basically, in terms of report execution, the uh, SQL Server Reporting Services reports are stored on a central server. Uh, there's a kind of um, a folder hierarchy um, that um, uh, allows you to secure reports either individually or by folder. And the user can um, uh, select various reports as their favorites and go to any of their favorites directly rather than navigating. Um, there is a download option on the report, so you can download into any number of uh, data formats. And um, there are some management functions where you can, um, for example, uh, specify a subscription services so that you can push out emails with the report um, directly to whoever wants to see this information at various scheduled times. Um, yeah, so in terms of building the report, I find it to be a, a very easy to use, um, intuitive uh, drag and drop user interface. Um, this is your basic layout of that aging report we uh, are gonna talk about more. Um, the reports are constructed or defined as, okay, um, a, a matrix or a, a table that's um, uh, uh, called a tablet or matrix. And uh, there's a data set defined, which is basically your SQL query into one or more data sources. And then um, it's a drag and drop from uh, the, the field in the data set onto the report. And um, you can link between data sources, which we'll talk a little bit more about using a lookup function. 
And you can see that some columns um, are formatted as expressions, which um, is asking report builder to, uh, uh, to manipulate uh, data to um, represent it in a, in a way that uh, the user might want to see it. Okay, um, so we've used SRS to create a lot of tools that we use, um, not just in our unit um, or even access services, but across the library system. Um, we're not going to be able to look at all of them today. We looked at some. Um, we wanted to focus on the ones that that we have seen in our unit seen the highest impact. We'll look at those first. Um, Want to look at at least a couple of these aging reports. Uh, we call them aging reports because. One of the primary reasons, uh, primary functions of those is to identify requests that are aging, that are getting old and getting too old. Um, so we'll look at a couple of those reports. Um, I also want to uh, highlight an on-demand form that we use every day um, in the bar direct workflow that's made a dramatic impact. So we'll start with the, what we call the ILL aging report. Um, might be a little misnamed, it really is probably the ILL aging report, it's not just the interlibrary loan, Requests, but it's any request that um, we run through Iliad. Um, so that would include Rapid ILL, um, that would include um, our local scan and deliver, and it would include uh, user search. So those are all coming through Iliad. So um, what you'll see here is that it's this is bringing data from Iliad and Voyager together so that whoever's using this report has all that information right at their fingertips um, while they're approaching their work. And um, what you'll see is that you can either be choosing uh, to look at articles um, or loans. In this case, we're looking at articles. I wanted to showcase that because we've seen an even more dramatic impact with the article workflow. Um, and it's sorting requests by type. So we're looking right here at local uh, scan and deliver requests. Um, and by date and time, it's giving us other information like TN, location, title, call number, all this kind of stuff that's going to be useful to us in locating the material or, uh, or troubleshooting the request. Um, I want to note, point out that it is um, showing us the time, and this is really key for us in terms of um, prioritizing the request. For both loans and articles, we're using this to troubleshoot any request that's getting a little old. You know, so when I got this screenshot, this one here is an example. Hey, this is getting a little old. This is from two days ago. Uh, what's the story with that? Um, we're using it for that proactive um, problem solving rather than waiting to hear, oh, I never got my scan. Um, this, is, this is keeping us right on top of that. Um, for articles, it's also given us another huge benefit. We have a ton of work coming in uh, throughout the day, um, items that are being pulled from the stacks being brought into our scanning room. And this report allows us to organize um, that uh, material that's waiting to be scanned to be sure that the top priority um, um, requests are being handled first. So people are bringing material into that scanning room all day. Someone else is coming into that scanning room throughout the day with this report and being sure to pull out anything that is, hey, this is a rapid request and it's getting, it's getting on the old side. Hey, this is a scan deliver request from yesterday. Please put it to the top of the queue. All right, this um, has given us a great benefit in terms of being able to organize that work. Um, I want to draw your attention to this, this column right here, which is, it says last slash only lender. Um, this column identifies for us if we are the only lender uh, for this or if we are the last lender in the string. Um, we often have so many requests to troubleshoot, troubleshoot that uh, we're not going to be able to get to it all. Um, so this helps us prioritize situation where we are the only chance for the person to get this material, we're going to focus our efforts there. We're going to give um, the best efforts we possibly can, knowing that other requests are ones that we can um, feel more comfortable canceling quickly to get on to another lender where it's going to be filled. So um, uh, in our, the next slide, I was just going to uh, point your attention to, for example, these uh, parameters and what they look like in Report Builder. Um, I think I show you an expression for building the last lender, uh, although I think we'll, we'll see it again uh, in one of the other reports. Um, so for the Iliad uh, aging report, we're looking at two data sources, uh, Iliad um, and transactions table basically, and Voy the Voyager Oracle database. Um, and uh, the SQL pseudocode, which is in the data set in the report builder, 
um, just looks for uh, transactions from the LA database basically with, um, this is how the parameter is specified for the um, SQL Server database. Uh, sorry, where's the, um, I actually can pull up a laser, here we go. Uh, so this is how the parameters are um, specified. Um, and uh, the report that you just looked at was an article um, agent report. Um, if, it, if it was a loan agent report, we also uh, show the barcode. Um, and uh, you're allowed, you, you can uh, specify which columns display within the report based on parameters as well. Uh, so if um, it was a loan report, we would have shown the barcode as well. And this is a lookup where it basically establishes a relationship between the mm. um, Iliad item ID and the Voyager barcode in order to um, display that information. Uh, this is the expression for the last lender that I, I think we'll see again um, later. Okay, you know, so the impact of um, implementing this report, so bringing this report into our workflow, which we did a couple of years ago, um, is really been dramatic. You know, so as I said, it gave us that ability to prioritize requests um, very effectively for the scanning in particular, and for both loans and uh, article requests, we're identifying problems proactively rather than waiting to hear uh, about problems later. We can focus on situations where the last and only lender what that has translated to in terms of numbers, uh, in terms of turnaround time, um, has, it was a, a slight improvement for loans, uh, about a 60% improvement for loans, but with scanning, it's been really, uh, really dramatic. You know, for ILL articles, we went from 61 to 34 hours as our average turnaround time. That was a you know, more than 40% decrease. And then with scan and deliver, it was even more dramatic, you know, going down 40 hours, nearly nearly 70% decrease um, those hours, include evening weekend times. You know, so this puts us uh, consistently um, uh, where we need to be in terms of meeting our own service standards for these um, uh, services, which we were, uh, which was a problem in the past. So this report has really helped us improve our service a lot. Um, moving over to Bar Direct, for, I'm gonna look at this, we'll look at the agent report for this. Um, we had all the same problems with Bar Direct that we had with ILL early requests where we need to more proactively troubleshoot and be aware of MIA requests, all of that. But we also had this really tedious workflow um, where we have to bring, bring items here from other campus libraries to be processed in our Relay D2D system and then shipped out from Sterling. Everything comes here to be handled centrally. So that's about 50 or more items every day we do that by requesting them through our ILS. Um, the, the workflow in the, in the past was we didn't even know about these items until we printed from, from, from Relay. And we could see all these other locations and we could use the paper retrieval slip to do a manual call number search into our ILS and place a request. So it was a very cumbersome process and even more cumbersome, you know, now we had this printed slip, um, which is what you're seeing here in our lovely photo, which, uh, I'm so glad that that's a photo from, from uh, how we used to do it and not how we currently do it. Um, we had pieces of paper that then needed to be matched to the books when they came in. And uh, they wouldn't come in from all campus libraries at the same pace. So we would expect when they would come in and it would just be an expectation. Um, so it was, it was guesswork um, and it meant uh, matching slips and books and trying to organize that in a way sometimes we'd sort by call number, we'd sort by date. It was a very tedious, very time consuming process that we did every day. And it also didn't give us a very um, good way of tracking those requests uh, that, that we had put in. You know, uh, we, we wouldn't see if they'd say weren't coming in as expected, right? It, it was a difficult way to do that. Um, so we, two tools that we developed to change that workflow. One of them is this agent report. This works just like the ILL agent report in terms of giving us that information that we use for proactively um, addressing aging problems, right? Um, uh, this is by date and it's also giving us location, request number, all that that we just saw in the other report with the addition of some fields from Voyager. Um, so we're using it for that troubleshooting. We're also using it, we have the barcode field here this allowed us to, rather than doing a, uh, 
of key, manual keying and call number search, we are able to do a simple copy and paste into our ILS to, play, to do these requests now from any location that's not scrolling or fast. So for instance, this one here. And then it also gives us information from Voyager about the current call slip stacks. So we, this gives us instant tracking. We can see, okay, this call slip was placed and it's on route. We can tell it'll, it'll also give us status updates right here in this column all together in one report. Um, in addition, uh, we get a lot of duplicates for bar direct requests. We get multiple um, patrons wanting the same books on the same day. It happens basically every day. So here's an example. It puts it right at the top for us. Two requests coming from Harvard from two different patrons who want the same one of our books. Draws our attention to that right at the top of the screen. We can see which one of these requests is the one that came in first and cancel the other one right off the bat. Previously, we would only be canceling after the retrieval. So this helps us do that faster. Um, just want to mention this here. So this is what it looks like when we are one of the last or only lender. It gives us a little exclamation point there. Um, if we own another copy here at Yale and we're the last or only lender, it's also going to put information in here telling us, hey, there's another copy here. So for some reason, the vast copy is not found. Hey, we're the only chance for this person to get this book. We should be getting it from the LSF as our offsite storage. So this is giving us additional information, not just that we're the last lender, but also a second chance here to be able to get the item. Uh, so uh, I also am going to point out um, uh, this current status, which is the status of the request in the uh, BAR Direct database is either printed at Yale or emailed to Yale, uh, SDL being our school and departmental libraries, because this represented a, a big change in our workflow rather than printing out all those yellow slips um, that Chris had a, a picture of. Um, we uh, have split up the, um, the, the, the workflow to two streams. Uh, either we're printing them to um, go to the, the stacks for our um, uh, Sterling Library uh, books or um, the request for our school departmental library books are emailed to us and that's an email that we never open even because all that information is now on the age report. Uh, and again, we can use the barcode to issue the call slip through our ILS. So um, this is what the bar direct agent report, how it's built. Basically, we're using, again, uh, the data source of the SQL uh, server bar direct database, relay database, as well as the Oracle Voyager database. Um, the, again, expressions for last lender and the current call slip status. Um, Built-in report builder um, uh, is basically an if field looking at supplier code two for call slip status. Again, we're doing that lookup, so establishing that relationship between the item ID value um, and uh, the um, barcode in um, in Voyager. Um, so it's uh, uh, two different data sets that we're relating and then concatenating um, the uh, information, uh, sorry, we're bringing back the um, call slip status description, the call slip status date, and if it's unfilled for some reason, the, the reason code. So that's all uh, shown um, at execution time. Okay, um, so as I mentioned, you know, to, to really um, change this workflow, we had to bring two tools, you know, so we brought, we brought the aging report into effect and um, that meant, as Lauren just pointed out, that we didn't have to print these uh, retrieval slips for any libraries other than Sterling Bass anymore. Um, but that means we got to print them uh, when the books get here. And so um, we created uh, this on-demand form, which allows us to print the book band when the books arrive. Um, so we do it with the item in hand. Um, so no more of any of that sorting and matching um, it's a simple barcode scan. You, just, you know, the books arrive in the bin, you scan the barcode, the van comes up and it's quick and print. Prints, you know, on the van. It's, it's been a huge change uh, in time and, and in uh, the frustrations uh, that we used to, used to um, face with this process. So the impact on this workflow, um, as I said, has been you know, dramatic. You know, it's eliminated a lot of um, very tedious um, time-consuming work, made it much more efficient. It's also given us all of that benefit that we saw with the ILL report in terms of proactively sort of book troubleshooting. Um, it's given us a way to identify those duplicates right off the bat. 
Um, how this is translated to numbers here is, is a dramatic decrease in timeouts. Um, we didn't have a huge timeout number in the past, but it's re reduced to essentially zero. We saw an 85% decrease after implementing the use of these two tools. Um, so really, uh, we were able to um, really uh, almost eliminate that problem of things um, not being dealt with in a timely way. So um, those were some of the biggest impact tools that we've implemented here, but we've created a lot of other tools with SSRS that are being used in our unit, um, but also in other units um, throughout the library system here at Yale. Um, we're not gonna have a chance to look at all of these, um, but we'll look at a few of them. But just to point out uh, categories here, we have a lot of you know, um, real-time information lookups um, that are used um, by staff um, and not just even in access services. We have folks you know, from all, all, all types of units here at Yale. Um, other tools for optimizing operational workflow. Um, we created a, um, a way uh, for, to track uh, materials that are being uh, shipped around campus between different library locations, the LCS driver report um, that's being used every day and has had a big impact. Statistical report for trends and periodic reporting, scanning productivity and results. This is referring to um, um, not the scanning um, um, necessarily we were talking about before, but the shelf scan um, of our shelving operation. Um, and also for our ILL turnaround. Um, and we've also um, been able to create reports that help us with um, specific projects. And we'll look at that one later because a, a transfer project that we're working on right now. In, in terms of these uh, uh, data tools, um, what I try to do is kind of keep an ear open to questions and patterns of questions that come up um, so that uh, I can try to um, put together a tool that's going to service um, that question and others that might be kind of like it. Um, so for example, the ARIES query by instructor or title, this is one of our so-called lookup tools. So you need it, uh, you use it as you need it. And what that uh, does is um, allow our frontline services people, it might be students at the desk, uh, might be other staff, you know, who don't work with ARIES every day, but to answer questions about um, people coming to the desk that's saying, oh, you know, I have this instructor, I don't know what's on reserve. Um, I have this title, I don't know what the call number is or if it's on reserve or whether it's ready. So um, that's an example of one of the, um, one of the tools uh, that we use. Great. Um, so let's look at one of those lookup tools. Um, the Voyager Transaction Lookup Tool, again, this is being used every day, um, not just by folks in our unit, but um, we use it heavily. Um, we find that there are pieces of data that are really important pieces of data that are in our systems, in this case Voyager, that are hard to find and hard to get to. And in some cases, um, they're in there, but there's actually no way to get to it um, in the user interface. Um, what this report does, which is um, simply a barcode lookup, um, it gives you all kinds of information about the circulation transactions um, relating to that item. So you'll see here it's giving in this, uh, this top section information about charging and discharging, so the history of that. So it's telling you where and, and by whom and when these, this item was charged and discharged in the past. This is very, this is hard information to get to, and some of it you, uh, is not visible in, uh, in Voyager, um, but it's crucial for being able to track down an uh, item that is, that, that is not where it's supposed to be. To know that uh, it was discharged by this person in that location is really crucial information for us. It does the same for call stuff history. So if it's recently been requested, we can see um, um, by whom and where it was requested to. Again, very helpful for tracking down things that are missing. Uh, in addition to that, it uh, includes information here about the notices. So if there were notices we call overdue, the, those type of notices sent out, it tells when those notices were sent. Um, this can be really helpful when you're working with a patron um, to, you know, to resolve an issue. UPS tracking, as I mentioned before, we, we ship out materials from all campus locations here. Um, and so they often want to know about their materials, about the tracking progress for those shipments. Uh, in the past, the only way they were able to get to that was to contact us, with, uh, to ask uh, for us to look it up for them. 
This gives them access to that information themselves. Um, it's a simple uh, lookup by an ILL or bar direct request number, or alternatively, you can just look up the lender symbol and it will bring that's uh, that's what this search is here. It's the search um, put in the Columbia symbol and it's showing us all of the recent shipments that have been sent the last 60 days with the shipments that have been sent to Columbia with the UPS tracking numbers. Right, so for more specific tracking, this can be put right into the UPS tracking function. A special project. Um, so we have a project here uh, that we're doing right now at Sterling um, where we need to transfer um, 500,000 items uh, out of the Sterling general collection. As I mentioned before, we usually do about 75,000 items a year. So this, is a, this is a big uh, undertaking for us, and it's in a short, um, strict uh, timeline. This is construction, and this is a construction enabling project, so we only have nine months to do this. And that was quite a, uh, a puzzle for how we were going to get this done. Um, this is a legacy collection. Um, our Yale class collection, and so that the cataloging records are in all kinds of conditions from good to bad to, to very, very bad. Um, and we therefore need to pay attention to that. We need to identify, you know, which, which records need, you know, a higher level of attention than just my team can give. Um, that's a crucial part of this. Uh, we don't want to be sending things to our offsite storage, um, not in, in good cataloging condition. Additionally, we wanted to be able to uh, identify materials that are good candidates for sending to our rare book library. Um, um, we also wanted to uh, take note of anything that's a frequently circulated item to exclude it from the transfer so we can actually keep it here in the building to keep it on campus. It's a lot of things to identify. It's sort of an um, important triage process for this. And it was a real challenge to think, how could we get the proper attention to these records to be sure that they're being handled in the right way while also maintaining uh, what for us is a really uh, accelerated pace, uh, half a million books in less than a year. Um, and we drew on SSRS to help us with it. Um, so we created this tool, which is again, just a simple barcode lookup. So it's just scanning the barcode for each item and it does an immediate uh, query of the relevant Bib and holdings records, uh, the holdings record, the relevant fields in those records from Voyager uh, with logic um, that's been put in place to evaluate the, the data that's there. So it's looking to see is that data, does that um, data that's in those fields imply that this is something that needs to be handled by a, you know, by a cataloging um, staff member rather than by my team, right? Um, it will actually highlight the field in a color that tells us right off the bat. So we this color means it goes to cataloging. Um, so it's a really simple, uh, immediate um, answer to the triage question. Hey, this goes to that, this goes that direction. Additionally, it will look at the publication date, which we're using for identifying materials, which are candidates for the rare book library. Um, it will also pull circulation data to um, identify if this is something which meets the standards to be uh, circulated enough that we actually want to keep it here in the building so it's a candidate to be reclassed. It tells all that information with just one scan. Um, it's, it's in a very quick process and has made it, it's essentially this tool is making this project possible. Um, we've been using the tool for just a couple months and we're even sort of getting a little ahead schedule. So it's, uh, it's, it's really transformed this for us. So in summary, you know, the impact of these tools, which has been, you know, very dramatic in my unit uh, here at Sterling Bass, but it's also had um, far reaching impact outside of the unit. Um, everywhere where we've implemented these, we see uh, increased efficiency. We see the elimination or the reduction of tedious and inaccurate processes, things like the sorting and matching of slips or manual um, keying of uh, call number searches. The ability to prioritize workflows more effectively, um, making information more readily available to those who need it for any whatever process they're doing. Um, we've seen service implications here. We've seen improved service with quicker turnaround time, uh, fewer timeouts, consistently meeting our service standards across the board, uh, certainly in the, in the case of, of scanning. Um, these tools have really made that possible. Um, and I want to point out that this, you know, that to have an improvement like that, something like, you know, 70% you know, you know, decrease of turnaround time for 
our scan and deliver service. You know, that was done without any, you know, we didn't add new staff, right? You know, we were able to, it's just a better application of the existing labor resources. That's what these tools are allowing us to do. So in conclusion, um, the takeaway is to, uh, to know what your data knows. Um, so the data is in uh, our databases. Um, so it means you have to kind of dig around because there's not always great documentation, but um, dig around and fool around enough with the data structures and understand the relationship between them. And then um, just uh, maintain access uh, to the data, which is um, something that's going to become um, uh, extremely important as we go forward into uh, so-called cloud solutions um, that we continue to have access to our data um, so that we can, we can get the information we need out of it. Um, it's your data, so just keep that on your radar as well. Thanks so much, everyone. We'd be happy to take questions. Okay, we're just taking a look at uh, questions coming in by chat. Thank, thank you for, li for listening too, thanks. Thanks so much. Lois, are you getting uh, any uh, questions on your end? Hmm. So we see that one question coming in. How do you identify areas that you wanted to focus on for uh, for improvement? Um, it's a great question. Thank you so much for that. Um, so in some cases, you know, we were aware. You know, I've mentioned the decrease in scanning, scan and deliver turnaround time. We were aware that we, you know, we weren't we weren't consistently hitting our service standard. So so it was really being driven by a sense that hey, we weren't where we wanted to be. Um, and so we needed to improve there. Um, I would say the same with the bar direct workflow. Um, we were aware that there were more timeouts than, than we wanted to see. Um, and that that workflow itself, you know, it was one of these things you just look at it and it looked so um, inefficient that you said there's got to be a better way uh, to do that. So some of them were, you know, kind of visceral mm -hmm. um, things like that. In other cases, you know, like this, the Yellow Class project, the transfer project, um, it was you know, really a necessity. This thing fell in our lap, and it was uh, how can we possibly do this? Um, and Lauren was able to create that tool very quickly. Um, uh, I mentioned the uh, the LCS driver report, which is the tool we use for moving materials around, for tracking materials that are moving around on campus. Um, we had some changes in terms of you know some uh, staff were. Um, started working in a new location. So there was a lot more movement of materials than there had been before. And that raised it for us. It was, how can we uh, move uh, materials and be sure that they're, that they're, they're, they're tracked more effectively. And the, part of that was also the, the folks who were in charge of the vehicles that are going to all different locations, making sure that they weren't um, going to locations more often than they needed to. So that the driver report helps organize the route for deliveries. Um, so again, that was one that came up to us as a, um, as a uh, problem that, that surfaced with, uh, with a change of location. Yeah, I, I would second what uh, Chris said about it being uh, often very visceral. So you see something like those, those slips, those yellow slips, uh, and you see people sorting books and sorting slips every day, and you say, so this is, there's got to be a better way. Um, uh, actually, with the LCS uh, report, uh, we were using kind of Excel spreadsheets that we'd send to each other. And again, it just felt like uh, there's got to be a better way. Um, and uh, it's a good question, though, because when you say, how do you, uh, the question, two of them seem very similar, but how do you identify areas to focus on for improvement? Uh, the answer, one answer is it never ends. So it is a matter of prioritizing because let's face it, everything can be improved. 
Um, there's always there's always a better way. So um, yeah, you work on the things that that look uh, like they're just crying out um, for quicker improvement and as quickly as possible. Any other questions? I did forget to mention our, you know, our, I forgot to go to the contact slide there. You know, we'd be happy to um, talk to anyone individually if you're, you know, looking at uh, um, workflows in your own area and wanted to talk with myself or Lauren, um, we'd be happy to, you know, take an email um, and, or, you know, figure out a way to be in contact to help, help you at your location. Okay, any other questions? Thanks everyone really for, for listening and um, yeah, for very great questions as well.